uh, always more of an upper hand sort of a discussion and the youth have been left out in these discussions. But the question is, have they really been left out or they're included? It's just the visibility is not there. So today's discussion, when we're talking about strengthening preparedness and resilience, uh, we're going to have three keynotes, uh, and these are experts from their own field, and we've seen the involvement within the pandemic preparedness front and what they do within the health space. Um, we'll go to the next slide, but today I'm going to be your moderator. My name is Ms. Lizio Tai. I'm based in Nairobi, Kenya, and I'm a development communication consultant. Um, so for today's discussion, we're looking at youth's involvement. When we talk about health threats, we'll let, let it be on a pandemic or epidemic level, we're trying to bring the youth at the forefront. We're talking about having them have a seat and be visible from the get-go. Um, next slide, please. Thank you. Just a few housekeeping rules. Um, we're requesting if you're on this call kindly, just have yourself on mute. We do have an option of using the chat for Q&A, but also during the Q&A session, we will let you raise and use your electronic hand so that you can give your comments, your concerns, or any question that you'd want to direct. But just to reiterate, this is a, a round table. So it's a bit different from, from webinars. What we're doing is when there's a comment made during the keynote, please, if you have any question before the keynote speaker drops off, just raise your hand and we'll pick that up and we'll call you and you can unmute yourself. Uh, this session is purely being conducted in English. It's being recorded, and this recording will be made available by YIDP group, uh, and I know that we'll share that later on. The session, as I mentioned earlier on, it's a one hour, 30 minutes, and we're hoping we'll stick to time, because I know how pandemic preparedness discussions can, you know, take longer time than initially intended. Uh, next slide, please. So just to give a bit of background on who YIDP is, and this is one of the many roundtables that they've actually hosted, and the key focus is youth involvement. I will take it back to Collins to just give us a bit of background so that we understand who's hosting us today. Collins, over to you. I think, Liz, I lost you, but uh, let me, you can hear me. <laughs> okay, great. Um, youth. Uh, just to give an overview of uh, what we are and what we do, um, youth uh, initiative uh, development uh, in Kenya. So our aim basically, uh, we've come up to uh, inspire and empower vulnerable young people Aye. through various intervention programs, including training community, uh, building, promoting uh, youth engagement through volunteerism. And also, we focus on uh, several intervention areas, just to mention, uh, but a few uh, education, um, uh, ICT, uh, poverty relief among youth, and uh, youth health and well-being and stakeholder convening. So um, we are doing this today uh, because uh, youth uh, needs to uh, stand, and uh, we need to play a role in uh, decision making. And we really believe this conversation is going to uh, bring in some insight. Sorry, I think I lost you for a split second, Collins. You're on mute. I am uh, back. Sorry, Liz, for that. No worries. Yes. Y yes. So, like I mentioned, uh, we focus in uh, on areas such as health, uh, poverty, um, uh, poverty relief among the youth, ICT, education, and stakeholder convening. So, in today, this discussion is uh, important discussion. Uh, like I mentioned when we started, uh, youth are the COVID teachers uh, three years ago. So it's high time uh, the youth stand up. And uh, the only way we can know uh, the various areas that the youth can be supported and the area, uh, areas that the youth, the role the youth that can play in, uh, in, in, in pandemic preparedness. And that's why we are convening this today. So even without wasting time over uh, to Liz, the moderator of today, uh, to take uh, chat now. Over to you, Liz. 
Perfect. Yeah, you're breaking quite a bit, but I think we got the gist of it. And thank you very much for that uh, bit of background. Um, so this is the program of, of today, and we're going to have three keynote addresses, as I mentioned, and these are experts within the the health space from different angles. So we have CSO representative, the private sector, um, and we also have Pandemic Action Network that have played a key role in the pandemic fund formation. And they have literally a lot of work around pandemic readiness in terms of COVID-19 and the Africa Alliance also has been, has been doing a lot of things around vaccines, ATC. And today's discussion, we just want them to let us know around the work they're doing uh, in terms of pandemic preparedness and health threats, what slot has been given to the youth. So we're going to have three keynote addresses, then we're going to open it up for um, an open forum, but we're also going to have a two minute address from Tangaza University, and then we'll have a wrap up that's going to be done by Robinson later on. So without wasting any more time, let's just start off the discussions and given our, um, our fast speaker, to get, deliver the keynote address. So next slide, please. So um, I know we have uh, Onesmus Kalama online. Um, Onesmus, if you can come through, have your video on and just give us a bit of background about what you do uh, about EA NASO's role and what you're doing around strengthening preparedness and resilience for emerging threats from a CSO's perspective, but also having the youth um, at the forefront and at the back of all these discussions. So Onesmus, over to you. Thank you, thank, thank you, Lizzie. Uh... Hi, Lizzie. I can hear you. I can hear you. I can see you. So you're good to go. Yeah, you had muted. You had muted me. The host had muted me. Uh, sorry about that. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> Thank you very much. Where I am is a little bit cold. That's why I am in some crazy, crazy outfit. Not, not, not as a good um, portrait as the one on your screen. That, that's a lovely one. So my name is Aronis Masamleo uh, Kalama colleagues, and uh, I'm a technical person working with Lizzie at EA and so. Uh, and um, we do quite a lot of work around pandemic preparedness um, since the onset of COVID-19. Uh, what we realize is that uh, health programs are highly dependent on what happens in our environment. We had made such great steps on HIV, TB and malaria interventions. Communities were busy going on their day-to-day -day businesses, identifying new patients, new clients, um, the clients going, getting their supplementation and medication. But when COVID hit in, actually it was a totally different ball game. Uh, crazy laws came in, there were lockdowns and the disruption of health programs was massive. Now, I think that spurred uh, uh, us to start really seriously thinking about uh, uh, pandemic preparedness. Lizzie, do you hear me? Yes, loud and clear. If I lose you, I will unmute and I'll, I'll give you a heads up, but I can hear you. Is But your video has gone off. Yes, um, ladies and gentlemen, this is expected when we rely 100% on, on tech. Uh, but Onesmus, once you're on, just let me know. We lost you for a minute there. Um, so we'll just proceed until we get a heads up. Um, when Onesmas is back, but we'll go to the next slide. And I, I know the, the work that the CSOs do across um, pandemic preparedness and, and health threats, it's quite immense because we've seen with this particular pandemic, the community engagement has been key in ensuring that you know a lot of things are, are kind of working and are put in place. So we'll just dive to the next uh, keynote address. And uh, all the way from Zambia, we have Perry Kent, and Perry Kent is the lead uh, project lead and strategist for the African Alliance. I do know a lot about African Alliance and what they're doing, but it will be nice, Perry Kent, for you to come in. Give us just a brief about what you do at African Alliance, what African Alliance is all about. And when we're talking about preparedness and uh, resilience, health, emerging health threats, where what role can the youth actually play? Over to you, Perry Kent. 
Thank you so much, Liz. Um, uh, please let me know if uh, my sound is good. Yes, loud and clear. Thank you. You can proceed. Thank you. My name is Perry Kent Nkole. I'm from Zambia and I work uh, for the African Alliance as project lead and strategies for um, an intervention called the Ports to Arms project, which I'll talk about in a bit. Um, and I must say it's an honor to uh, be here and share some insight around strengthening pandemic preparedness for emerging threats and looking at it from a youth centric uh, approach or point of view. But I think also as we are looking ahead uh, regarding pandemic preparedness, uh, we must do so by also um, looking back and uh, considering some of the lessons that we've learned uh, from the past. Um, greetings comrades that are joining uh, this call from different uh, parts of the world. Uh, like I mentioned earlier, my name is Perry Kent Nkole and I work for the Alliance, uh, the African Alliance to be specific. Um, and just a bit about the African Alliance. Initially our work was around um, uh, HIV prevention, uh, but the organization has uh, developed a consistent program and uh, practice advocating for accountability uh, to communities affected by and uh, you know participated in uh, participating in public health research programs and the rollout of locally appropriate uh, services. The current portfolio of the African Alliance uh, work includes COVID-19 related research, advocacy and mobilization, uh, global lobbying interventions, as well as strategic partnership uh, development. Um, the African Alliance is also home of the People's Vaccine Alliance, which is a global movement of organizations and networks uh, supported by Nobel uh, laureates, uh, heads of state, you know, um, health experts um, as well, economists, world leaders, faith leaders, activists, working together to ensure that Africans everywhere have equitable access to vaccines. Uh, PVA Africa has rep uh, representation from all Africa's five regions and has provided subgrants to partners across uh, the continent to support local uh, lead advocacy and engagement strategies that advance vaccine confidence and build on historical work to strengthen community engagement in a diversity of uh, contexts. Now, the African Alliance has piloted a groundbreaking pandemic preparedness and response approach called the Ports to Arms, um, which is a community-led public health accountability mechanism that tracks barriers and enablers uh, you know, of uh, COVID-19 vaccines, specifically within the African context. We have piloted the project or the intervention in three provinces of South Africa, namely Mpumalanga, Gauteng, and Limpopo, with support from the uh, South African Medical Research Council and the Department of Science and Innovation. Um, and of course, we've tested the tools of the project itself in North, East, Central, and Southern Africa. And right now we are testing the uh, research intervention um, in the Malawi cholera crisis that's currently happening, as well as trying to understand how you know, gathering data can uh, be feasible and possible in a North African context in Egypt, where access to information is a bit of a challenge. I think one of the more important things that we need to consider is that evidence-based approaches are much more effective. And it's something that we saw that was lacking during the COVID-19 pandemic. And that is the gap that an intervention like Ports to Arms comes in to be able to collect findings, to collect the, to gather the experiences of communities, to, to have an understanding of issues around hesitancy, because for so long there's been uh, assertions and uh, misconceptions that Africans are anti-vaccines. But when we, uh, uh, you know, when we go on the ground, we find that there are a number of factors around misinformation and disinformation that fuel, um, you know, vaccine hesitancy and thereby affecting um, access and uptake to vaccines in uh, the African context. Now, the COVID-19 pandemic exposed the fragility of healthcare systems globally, but more specifically in Africa, where developing countries were already struggling with, uh, you know, managing other health burdens such as HIV, cancer diabetes, heart diseases, and so on. The pandemic overwhelmed healthcare systems in both developed and developing countries alike. Africa, um, as you may well know, has one of the weakest healthcare systems uh, globally, uh, you know, and also there's limited evidence on how the region is prepared for and impacted by, uh, mm -hmm. you know, responded. Um, it Perry Kent, somebody has muted you. Sorry about that. Uh, is that the 
host giving us a hard time. Carry on, Perican. Somebody had muted you. Sorry about that. I'm not sure. I'm not sure at what point. Well, it's I just would... the, the last statement, but okay. you are fine until then. Um, from the onset of the uh, COVID-19 pandemic, like Onismas had started touching on, it was evident that Africa's health systems were inadequately prepared for pandemic, and its impact was indeed substantial. Responses were slow and did not match the magnitude of the problem. The COVID-19 ex, uh, you know, pandemic exposed, among other things, the lack of leadership in African countries. Corruption related to COVID-19 has been reported you know, from all over Africa, mainly in procurement. In Cameroon, for instance, a 2021 audit revealed the misuse of about $333 million meant for the pandemic response in 2020. South Africa's health minister at the time was placed on leave while uh, irregular you know, contracts um, you know, to the tune of $10 million were investigated. There was also public anger in the country where the uh, sus uh, suspected inflation of government uh, contracts for the purchase of medical supplies worth $900 million. Our leaders in Africa were more reactive than proactive our systems sidelined and neglected communities when we should have invested more in meaningful uh, community engagement. The direct implication of neglecting communities before and during the COVID-19 pandemic has been vaccine hesitancy fueled by lack of information and um, you know, um, lack of effective awareness interventions. National policies and strategies are not driven by real evidence gathered through community-led and centered processes, but heavily shaped by donor and private sector influence, which continue to put political uh, you know, expediency and profiteering before our lives. This has led to a waste of resources as programs are implemented based on boardroom discussions instead of meaningful community engagement. Lack of transparency and accountability has led to lack of public trust in health systems across the African continent. We have examples uh, in Zambia, for instance, where the government was putting expired or expiring medicine you know, on the market. And when people discovered this, it further reduced the trust that the public had in the healthcare system. This is just one among many examples of how corruption and lack of transparency and accountability has reduced public confidence in uh, the healthcare system. This then begins to affect even access and uptake of vaccines because when, the, when there's a global pandemic and the healthcare system has no public trust, it becomes very hard to convince people that you're trying to save their lives and indeed the vaccine is safe for them. I'll highlight three major lessons that we've picked up from the COVID-19 pandemic that we think are very key. Which is good, yes. Um, and also just to give you a heads up, um, you're running a bit short of time, but good for you to just also try and wrap it up uh, while you're going through that. Thank you. Yes, indeed. Just three lessons that we've picked up uh, from the COVID-19 pandemic that we feel are very key as we prepare for the next pandemic. Number one, universal access to vaccines. We learned that from the COVID-19 pandemic, there was no deliberate uh, you know, technology transfer mechanism to expedite the manufacturing of, of vaccines globally, specifically in the global south. Inadequate uh, inequalities in access to finance, while we acknowledge the adverse impact, negative impact of the COVID-19 pandemic on global economies, uh, developed countries could afford to stay home while poor countries were forced to choose between life and livelihood. Inadequately and intentionally underserved populations were disproportionately affected as they were already facing systematic uh, you know, issues around access uh, to health services. And so where this leaves us is at, a, at an awkward time, but we need to build trust in healthcare systems. But as I conclude, as the World uh, you know, Organization declares an end to COVID-19 as a global health emergency, the world risks making the same mistakes of not learning from the past mistakes of poor pandemic preparedness and response. Health system strengthening cannot be achieved without ensuring meaningful community engagement uh, interventions and representation of communities in all structures of decision-making of global health response. We need to position our healthcare systems to anticipate future pandemics and use past lessons and evidence as leverage to minimize catastrophic impact of global health crisis. Thank you so much. And of course, I look forward to uh, the discussion.
Yes, definitely. And and Perican, before you hang up, I just I just want you to come back a little bit because I know one of the findings that you got was underserved populations, and and what Collins was mentioning at the beginning was the youth were left out. And when we came to have a, a another roundtable discussion on mental health, we found that this lot were the ones that were most affected um, with uh, during the pandemic. But just a quick one in terms of the findings. Is there a mechanism or for the pots to arm solution that you have, which is pretty amazing? Is there a way you are tapping into the youth um, as, a, as a human resource? Because, and when it comes to vaccine hesitancy, I feel like using an influencer, the youth are always on social media, just talking about what are the impacts of not taking the vaccines would have really driven up the uh, vaccine uptake. I would love to have your thoughts on that before we actually move in uh, back to Onesmus to give us his remarks. Thank you so much, Liz. And of course, we can talk about youth and COVID-19 without mentioning the issues of unemployment that came about because of the pandemic, um, which tells us a lot about how much we need to work on in, in terms of ensuring that um, uh, the youth are not um, affected in the way that they were. But I think um, I'll touch on the point that you raised in using young people as a resource. Um, and I think if you look at um, the HIV response, most of the interventions that worked during HIV is when communities were engaged, communities were involved, and there were interventions of raising awareness. And I think this is where young people can really come in um, as a resource during these interventions um, when we're trying to raise awareness. We can create employment for young people while they are also contributing to the fight and indeed to uh, ensuring that there's equitable access to vaccines. We can use young people's, uh, you know, um, uh, skills with regards to social media and the influence uh, that they're, put, they're, they're, they're able to garner online to ensure that we spread the word on vaccine hesitancy. We can make vaccines cool using young people and ensure that people are able to have access to vaccines. But I think we need to have a much broader discussion on how to position, um, you know, the youth population in, with regards to future pandemics, because we've seen that a pandemic like COVID-19 that required people to stay home didn't work so well for young people. But we've seen the level of innovation that has come through where young people are still able to make money even online. So it calls for um, a conversation on changing systems, a, a conversation on innovation, but also a conversation on using young people as a resource in ensuring that we come up with interventions that put communities at the forefront, but also at the center of the discussion. Perfect. Um, I, I like that feedback. And that actually takes me back to Onesmus. I hope you're back online. And we're talking about underserved populations. Uh, these are the youth. And we're talking about populations that were left out. We're discussing strengthening preparedness and resilience for any other threat that we might um, you know, deal with later on. Onesmus, if you're back. Um, yes, I'm back, Lizzie. I'm back. Perfect. Okay. So you can pick up the conversation from there. And I know CSO's power in mobilizing and working with the youth has been intense. So it will be good for you to also kind of uh, just chime in on this discussion. So over to you. Yeah, I'll pick it from there. And I, I, I will probably um, say because I, um, Pericat has, has actually given a very good uh, um, ride onto this. So I, don't, I really don't have to get back and, and do a lot of um, uh, explanation. But what 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 I like telling people is that we lost the war on COVID because we left the greater majority of the population out of the response. When you talk about youth in um, sub-Saharan Africa, they compromise they comprise sixty five to seventy percent of the total population. Now, seventy seventy percent of the population was actually left out of the response, and we expected to win a pandemic. That's virtually impossible. That, that's that's basically what uh, what 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 happened. And then what what then it means it meant was this group which we neglected both at the decision making table and in profiling the interventions ended up actually becoming carriers of the pandemic. Youth was strong. COVID could not actually naturally deal with this vigor and vitality of the youth, and uh, because we thought they were less at risk. We did not put a lot of uh, influence and focus on them. They became careers. They took COVID back to their grandparents. They actually made sure that their grandparents had COVID and their grandparents died. And those are just simple facts. Yet, we are actually dealing with a very strong army 
that can actually turn mountains. We could have won the war on COVID simply on social media. We left the social media to run amok with false information. Every other morning, every other second, you would see a message popping on your phone. It's coming from Nigeria. If you get the vaccine, you will start to be moving in restaurants and all the knives and forks will be flying on to uh, attach to your arm because you got a vaccine. I mean, it was all crazy, scary, false information that was flying right, left and center through social media. Yeah. If we had tapped on the power of the youth, they use social media every day. We would have actually made sure that the right information is sinking in communities because we would have actually used the power of the social media to pass the right information that would have ended up scaling up COVID interventions and we would not have had the number of deaths which we had simply because we neglected a very strong army of youths who are actually moving things today. So what am I saying in, 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 in essence? I think in many discussions, we have really um, neglected the youth. Right now, I'm in another conversation on the new medical countermeasures. If a new pandemic were to come in today, how can we respond meaningfully and effectively? And even in that conversation, I'm still seeing us talking about the real people who could actually make a difference. And these are the youth. They will actually literally carry vaccines from point A to point X, where accessibility is impossible. Are we using this power? We are not using it. I mean, they are actually able to influence uptake of vaccines in their own communities, because if you walk to a rural village and there is a boy who went to class seven, actually that is the professor in the village. Everybody who says, you have anything, a letter to be read, ah, just go to someone's home. That is where the professor is. And this is a boy who actually went to class seven. That is the power of education and youth. Why are we not tapping into this? So it is for us, for instance, in, at ENASO, we have made it mandatory to actually target adolescents, youth, and young people in various interventions, including pandemic preparedness. They have the power to make things move, including SRHR. I mean, if you're having 70% population being young, and you're thinking of Africa not uh, moving into the seven, into the one billion mark. I mean, that's a dream. We are going to get there very soon because we still have a lot of young blood in this space. So I think we cannot ignore youth in any health response, ignore youth at your own peril. And our business is to ensure that youth are at the center of decision-making in every health aspect, including pandemic preparedness. Thank you very much, Lizzie. Thank you, Nesmas, and I like the way that you've just picked it up from Perikant. So I'm going to take you back just to one question. And Perikant did emphasize that we need to benchmark. We need to, you know, take the lessons learned from the other pandemics and use it for the next pandemic. In your own point of view, given the work that Ianasa does, uh, and 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 I might say that that's a great work, given communities, uh, you know, getting involved in all the health issues. There is community involvement when we come to tackling HIV, TB, and malaria. And this has worked perfectly. Even the communities themselves are involved in this. Is there a lesson, a key lesson that we can take for when we're talking about the next threat? I mean, we have World Bank, Global Fund, other big development partners, even governments talking about what next, how can we tackle the next pandemic? Is there a lesson we can learn on how the youth have been uh, utilized in the fight against HIV, TB, and malaria that we can replicate? What are your exactly, thoughts? exactly, and, and and you're right. I mean, um, in all these pandemics, I mean, there has been a, a similar trend, a similar trajectory. Uh, I mean, first, an overall ignorance of the communities and thinking government can do it all, and then it doesn't work. Then opening the doors for communities now to start taking a much more active role, and things start working. But even when communities now start taking a much active role, realize that they're actually real movers, are actually the youth. If you look at the HIV response today, it's purely driven by the youth. Tell me how many how many people really these days go and queue on a on, on a on a on a on a on a visiting facility or a health facility to get information on HIV and AIDS or TB. No, everybody's just busy on their phones quickly. I mean, how do I get to know this? And once someone has known something, it spreads like wildfire. Trust me. We keep on talking about unintended pregnancies and unwanted abortions happening every other single day. 
ask everyone who has actually done unwanted abortion. They did not go to a health facility. All they did was just simply say, Lizzie, hey, I've not seen my monthly periods for the past two months. Oh, really? What you do is there is pill A, B, C, D that looks like bluish red water, pop two, and everything is done. That's how actually it's moving. And today, when we are talking about HIV counseling, testing, and all these other kind of 1995, it's all being driven through social media. It's like, have you done your drugs this morning? Hey, baby, it's time for you to do your drugs. And, and people are doing that. And it is really sparring a, 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 a increased uptake of medication because people are reminding each other every other single day. I mean, things are actually flowing. Even in pandemic preparedness, as we prepare for the next pandemic, let us learn from what has happened and let us already build on using the right infrastructure to tackle the next pandemic. If a new pandemic is going to break today and we actually take youth take charge of yes. that pandemic, trust me, we are going to stop that pandemic before it actually becomes viral. Because it is that easy. It has happened in this area. Please, this is what we did in our particular place. Could you do the same? Information like that will spread like wildfire and we are going to step out pandemics before they become a global uh, uh, challenge. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I'm so excited we have Ramon on the call. Ramon, I will call you after the next uh, keynote address because you're passionate about youth. You work with youth. It will be good to also get your insight. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, that was um, a presentation from Perry Kent, Africa Vaccine Alliance. Then we've got CSO Perspective from Onesmas Kalama, Ian Asso. And now this is, this is the cream de la cream. This is the person we need to hear from <laughs> because we have the pandemic fund that has been put in place. Now, Nahashan, over to you. Why are we not tapping into the youth? And I'm hoping that the discussions that are going on on a, on a broader scale about talking about the next pandemic, when and if it happens, and we're hoping that the youth are actually in the middle of these conversations. So over to you, Ones. Um, sorry, Nashon, if you can take us through this today's discussion and just what, what role are the youth playing? Are we considered, because I still feel like I'm a youth, are we considered in those bigger <laughs> I feel like a youth. Over to you, Nashan. Uh, thank you, Lizzie, and it's great listening to uh, my other speakers, the ones who have just uh, preceded me. And I want to begin first by acknowledging uh, why uh, IDP for convening uh, this high level virtual roundtable. I think uh, uh, it's really timely and it's exciting that it's uh, a youth centric one. And uh, I also convey fans best wishes to uh, youth initiative development programs as uh, they work towards uh, the convention uh, in August later this year. Um, as Lizzie said, I'm a Nahashan Alwoka. I'm uh, privileged to work with the Pandemic Action Network, uh, which was established uh, to drive a collective action to help end the COVID crisis and prevent the next pandemic. At present, we are a network that consists of about 350 partners across different sectors and geographies. And uh, we all work to build and sustain political will influence relevant policies and mobilize the resources that are necessary to ensure that the lessons uh, from the COVID crisis and uh, Perry Kent and uh, Onesmas have hinted at this, you know, uh, we work to ensure those lessons translate into a future uh, where humanity as a whole is better prepared uh, to deal with emerging infectious disease outbreaks and stop deadly and costly pandemics like COVID uh, from happening again. Uh, when I, I had a, a chat with Collins and I asked him, what do you expect from me? Um, you know, um, he tasked me to share reflections on um, how young individuals, and Lizzie, this is the question that you have also put to me, uh, can be equipped with the necessary knowledge, skills, and support systems uh, to effectively respond to and mitigate challenges posed by the various emerging uh, threats. Now, this is a fair task, and I know um, I'll try to do this in the shortest time possible. Uh, I want to acknowledge that young people are already uh, embedded into key roles within their communities, country, or region. Uh, from the uh, previous speakers, um, you know, um, it seems we're at a crossroads. Uh, we are involved. We are left in our outs. I'm not a youth. I'm 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 way past that age bracket. Uh, but as uh, you know, uh, you you'll accept some slips of the tongue if I I claim that today. Uh, you, you know, um, so the youth have 
uh, are already embedded into Kirols within their communities, and they're contributing in different ways to the social, economic, and political development uh, of their communities or countries or regions. And they have also been disproportionately affected by the, the historic pandemic. Uh, I can't mention some of that. Um, you know, and they have an immense contribution to make. Uh, that's not debatable in strengthening prevention, preparedness, and resilience for emerging threats. I, I, I looked at a study that was conducted by international labor organization and partners of the Global Initiative on uh, decent jobs for, for, for youth. And this, uh, uh, the, the survey uh, surveyed about 12,000 youths between the ages of 18 to 29 uh, from about 112, 112 countries in 2020, uh, with the aim of determining how young people are coping with the COVID pandemic. And it's interesting, it found out that the pandemic affected the youth uh, or young people um, in such a systematic, deep, and disproportionate uh, manner. And, and that, you know, the effects had been more difficult, uh, especially for young women and youth in lower income countries. Uh, education, uh, uh, the disruption to education, uh, loss of jobs, um, and especially for the age bracket of 18 to 24 was very pronounced. And those who were lucky to keep their jobs uh, during the pandemic, you know, uh, they experienced less, wa less working hours uh, and thus reduced earnings. And this combined with other social issues uh, you know, impacted young people's mental health uh, with many respondents reporting anxiety and, and depression. Now, the good news uh, to me uh, and what I'm also picking from um, the other preceding spe speakers, uh, this particular ILO study uh, did confirm that, uh, you know, despite all those challenges, there's a high proportion of young people who are turning the crisis into an opportunity for collective action by supporting their communities through volunteering and giving. So essentially, it's, it's clear, uh, the youth are already doing something. Now, I, I want to submit this afternoon that, you know, pandemics disproportionately affects young people uh, and that young people are already plugged into different spaces in their communities in, a, in, in different ways that contribute towards strengthening PPR. Um, you know, uh, but more must be done to optimally support young people. What are some of the specific ways in how we can do this? One, strengthening preparedness and resilience starts at the individual level. I, I mean, th that's the bottom line. Uh, if the communities are to be resilient, the individuals that constitute those communities have to be resilient at an individual level. And therefore, there's really need for urgent, targeted, and smarter investments in decent jobs for, for young people. Uh, educational institutions have a particular role to offer um, in improving training programs, uh, including online, on, online learning. Um, I mean, uh, the work that the youth have done in terms of confronting in, in, you know, um, the disinformation that Onesmas referred to has been immense. Uh, and and the, the, such kind of programs will um, enhance opportunities for young people. Uh, the COVID pandemic has exposed the need for robust capacity building programs um, that includes mentorship for young people in different areas that are critical for prevention, preparedness, and response, such as in uh, community surveillance, uh, epidemiology, risk communication and community engagement, health information and management systems, among others. And such support, you know, should not be on ad, uh, on ad hoc basis. Uh, you know, um, sorry, I got a poll, which I don't know came from where. I think it's- Yeah, sorry about particular. that. We were supposed to give a heads up to the participants. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Carry on. Yes, so, so such support uh, should not be on an on ad hoc basis uh, in response to a threat. Uh, in, and it's important that, you know, we build strong and resilient health systems, invest in young people, uh, you know, whether it's during peacetime, that's whether it's post pandemic or during inter pandemic times or during pandemics. Uh, there's a very good example of Sierra Leone. Um, you know, during the 2014 Ebola response, uh, young people were mobilized to set up hand washing stations and distribute food items, uh, you know, among other things. And such engagement continued after Ebola uh, with young, young community members developing their health and communication sensitization skills. Now, those are very important things. And, and uh, you know, what Perry said, what Onesma said, all are very important uh, things. But the underlying, the bottom line is that they require political will uh, to effect. Uh, the role of government, the role of decision makers uh, is, is key here. And whether youths are part of the decision making, 
that's that, that's another uh, you know uh, uh, side of the coin that we need to look at, but I don't have the time to look at now. But unfortunately, what we have learned over the years, when things don't attract the political cost, they don't get prioritized by governments, and there's a lack of accountability around such things. Health and pandemic threats, which affect our lives and economies, don't get the attention they deserve in Africa. And young people should federate to deploy their de demographic numbers in de demanding action on these things. Uh, we know the figures. Uh, Africa is the youngest population in the world, uh, with 70% uh, of sub Saharan Africa under the age of 30. Uh, I mean, uh, by 2030, uh, young Africans are, are expected to make up to 42% of the world's youth and account for 75% of those under age 35 in Africa. So essentially, this is an immense an immense resource that we, we have in the continent. We cannot sideline them. And I think um, um, the youth must be engaged. Um, they must proactively get to these spaces. And I want to end by just you know um, um, ma making three calls. Um, and I think the first one, the youth must really elevate their voices. Uh, in ongoing global health governance conversations and processes. Uh, this, for instance, include the intergovernmental negotiating body that's currently negotiating the pandemic accord. Uh, we have the amendment of the international health regulations, which is also running parallel to the INB process. Uh, Lizzie mentioned about the pandemic uh, fund. Uh, these are really important global processes. And as a continent, uh, as a youth constituency, uh, we have to engage and, 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 and follow what's happening in this uh, uh, particular uh, spaces. And important is that we need to ensure that our government representatives are engaging because most of them are member state led. Uh, and, and, you know, we get to inform uh, the positions of such uh, uh, actors in these processes. At the regional level, um, it is important that we closely follow uh, and engage with the processes to strengthen our continental health security, um, uh, you know, uh, such as the establishment of the Africa Pandemic Preparedness Authority. Uh, there's the Africa Epidemic Fund, operationalization of the Africa Medicines Agency, and implementation of the Africa Free Continental Trade Area, uh, for instance. Uh, the manufacturing of for medical countermeasures is it's really a debate that's really picking pace uh, in the continent. How are young people? plugging into these processes and raising their voices. Uh, I've seen we have a strong uh, network of uh, colleagues working um, you know, with a pot to arms uh, uh, agency. Uh, how are we engaging with these particular processes as, as we work to make sure that there's uh, you know, access to medical countermeasures, but that the um, um, uptake issues are also addressed. And lastly, uh, at the national level, uh, let us engage fully and support a health system strengthening right from the community level. Uh, young people can, for instance, join hands and collectively work towards realization of the universal health coverage agenda, volunteer and serve as community health volunteers, hold the government accountable on key commitments that will strengthen uh, PPR. So um, I, I think the youth are playing an important role in the continent, in different countries. They are in the front lines. That's non, uh, that's non debatable. But more still needs to be done really to optimize on the engagement of uh, young people. Uh, I look forward to enlightening conversations and uh, thank you once again to y uh, YIDP for the invitation for us to be part of this important event. Thank you and over to you, Lizzie. Thank you very much, Nash. And you literally you've touched on all the things I wanted to ask you later on, because I, I was looking forward to actually you mentioning all these other engagements that are going on at a higher level that the, the, the youth can actually tap into. But I know Ramon has a burning question. So Ramon, I'll let you unmute and ask your question. Just please feel free to make it short and do let us know who you're directing that question to. We do have another keynote coming in. But for now, we'll just take a few questions and then we'll go to the keynote. So Ramon, over to you, if you're still there. Yeah, I'm always here, so I'm going away. So uh, thank you very much. Actually, my is not really a question of words. It's just to just add my voice and align myself with what uh, not most, you know, highlighted during this presentation as that of the youth resilience. 
So and when we are looking at the lesson from the um, from the COVID-19, I'll be talking from Nigerian perspective. And because the reason why we are having this discussion now is because we are in a continent whereby the leaders don't pay more attention to the need of youth. The leaders don't pay more attention. There's no political will to actually build the institutional capacity of young people to, to take up opportunities. So that is the problem. So in the HIV AIDS response, there are already a system in place. And the system that actually helped the African continent. Many people, when we are looking at the, um, the statistics of the, of the um, HIV pandemic, looking at it from John uh, Hopkins University and all of that. So we are looking at the Africa where not fully affected and all of that. This is because we have a lot of young people in Africa here. They are very innovative. So and they are very, very concerned about what happened to their community. And one of the reasons why in last month, I will always give it to you. Thank you for always raising the voice of the youth in all platforms. I think the thought of what meeting I'm attending with you this week alone, and you've been always you know, speak up for the youth. So all of us that we add our voice, let's continue so that let's not be waiting that then all the youth must come together, all of us must start chatting and all of that. We that we have the voice, let's speak up for young people. So that is so that the people at the top, the policymaker, can take drastic decisions so that they can have that political will to move from their other law system and you know, be on the digital system and do the thing in the right way so that the African continent will also be able to compete with every other continent. The American, the Europeans, they are not doing better than we do, but they have a lot of resources. Their leaders are more interested about their young people. They are more interested about the future because when you are interested about the future, you will be putting the youth into consideration. When you remember about the history, you know that the youth must be at the front front. So let me do something so that I don't take much of the time. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And I like your comment just touches into what um, I believe one of the speakers mentioned um, that you, and it was a nation. What we when we're talking about youth involvement, a lot of people assume that we need to have them seated with WHO and Africa Union discussing, you know, all these issues. But also community work and community volunteer work really does have a lot of impact when it comes to emerging health threats. And we have to start using what we can with the resources that we have before we move into all this bigger space. And I, I understand the concern when it comes to political will, especially within the African context. But yes, we need to keep on forging on and doing what we're doing. Uh, Jonathan, I'll just go to you before I call the next keynote speaker. So uh, Jonathan, I've seen your hand up. If you're still there, please feel free to unmute. Yeah, thank you very much, Ms. Jonathan. And thank you. YIDP for the opportunity. I'm uh, speaking from Ghana. I am executive director of Dreamweaver Organization, president for Ghana Coalition of NGOs in Malaria, and also CCM, that is Country Coordinating Mechanisms in various countries, like for CS for me, working group. I am the chair. So I do a lot of activities on field and also in international discussions. So my concern here, during the pandemic, we realized that uh, as we are talking about youth today, it's very, very important. The youth were greatly affected. Schools were closed down for so many months and some are more than a year. Students were out of school, which they were highly affected. And also considering the informal side of uh, uh, the youth, when we, all the time when we talk, we think about, we think that all the youth are within the digital space, but a lot of them are also, yesterday I was on the field and we're trying to sell HIV self-testing and you need to have a WhatsApp before you collect uh, WhatsApp videos to watch and do it yourself. You will realize that a lot of them, like Simtress, those who are doing their learning trade, they don't have access to the WhatsApp. They just own the phone. So there is a barrier there. So talking about youth initiative for pandemic preparedness, considering the formal and the, the informal youth, what are the key 
uh, uh, issues or solutions we are putting there to bridge that gap. So uh, this is my concern to all the uh, speakers. Yeah, so, yeah. Uh, thank you, thank you. Thank you, Jonathan. And that's that's a very key concern because when we talk about youth, automatically your brain goes to the urban sector and we forget the rural setup. Um, so it's a good question. I mean, when we're talking about this youth uh, being part of the solutions for emerging threats, are we looking at both youth? And it will be good to get one of the speakers also to chime in on this. But before we go to Yaya, we're supposed to have a, um, another keynote address from um, Tengaza University College, which I know is a key partner when it comes to the event that's going to happen later on that's being hosted, the convention being hosted by YIDP. I don't know whether Kate, uh, if you're still there, please, you can introduce yourself and take over the discussions. They get pretty heated up. Um, so Kate, over to you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lizzie. Um, yeah. I'm sorry, my, my computer could not uh, engage. I'm using my handset and it is okay. So my name is Catherine Kisasa Mudonde. I'm a lecturer at Tangaza University College. I'm also a project coordinator on youth and children um, program on child safeguarding and protection. And um, at Tangaza, we have an institute for youth and child studies. And our main focus is mainly on um, this and families, because we also have another department that deals with counseling psychology, and our speciality is on uh, family, uh, child, and youth, and we also have trauma counseling. Now, from this perspective, we have so many departments, but one of the things that I've, I'm happy to be here today, and I want to thank the organizers of this program, because um, to us, this is one of our key love areas, and we feel privileged to be here. I talk um, from the perspective of youth and what it is that we have done after the COVID pandemic. Uh, one of the key um, benefits, I would say, is that Tangaza University College for a long time has been embracing a lot of online uh, learning and preparedness for the um, facilitators, the trainers, um, and even our students, so that every semester we do an online uh, training that prepares you for the 21st century um, teacher and learner. Now, when the pandemic came, um, within one month, Tangaza University College was running, was up and running. So we never got affected by the pandemic because of the prior preparations that we had, that our learners, the students, and the teachers were already online, and we were doing a lot of work. So when it came, we were ready, and we thanked God for that. Because in March 2020, our classes were fully operational, and quickly, we went into planning of how our students would access our modules from where they were. And that was done because we um, gave out um, all this uh, availability to the students to be able to join. So we gave them bundles. We were able to connect and uh, hook them wherever they were. Tangaza University College has uh, students from 62 uh, nationalities. And therefore, we were able to reach that number from wherever they were because of the networks that were in place. And we keep uh, continuing to thank God for this because it is what saved us. Coming to the strengthening of our youth, we have so many programs running at Tangaza University 
uh, especially on preparedness and resilience. Some of them happen um, online, some of them at campus, others on site. For example, we have a mental health program that runs for the refugee camps. And it's not just mental health, it's community mental health program. And here we teach uh, the youth within those institutions on preparedness, resilience, and sustainability. Therefore, for Kakuma and Dadab, we have programs that are holistic. We look at food security. We train our students who are there within this um, environment on how to produce a food that is um, healthy for everyone. And many of our students um, have food demos, uh, yards that are demos for the village where they are living in. And we have many of our lecturers going there uh, to stay for two weeks or a month to be able to accompany them because we do have mentorship and coaching programs on business entrepreneurship and life skills. And we do this because we know we want people who can be able to think about the gaps in the society, fill them up and be sustainable. And uh, about a month ago, we had students who came from Kakuma to come and in a conference to demonstrate that it is doable. They have been doing it and they are serving their communities with food uh, sustainability and therefore giving them healthy foods that prevent any sicknesses and take care of the uh, health matters. At the same time, uh, this mentorship uh, programs that are accompanied with life skills for the 21st century helps us uh, prepare these students to be resilient in whichever situation. For example, now I am taking a course uh, from May to August, a course on self-management. And on this course, we talk about all issues related to uh, life skills, or the 21st century skills. We talk about how to prepare yourself, all that. And so, um, Kate, we, Kate, just a quick one. Um, I'm just being given a read a lot on timing. Um, I'm supposed to cut you short, but if you could just wrap it up. Um, and okay. while, when you're wrapping it up, I know Jocelyn is asking, kindly link me up for the training. Um, so okay. it would be good for you to also respond to how she can reach out to you. Right. So. In a nutshell, I want to say we do have mentorship and uh, coaching programs on business startup and entrepreneurship. We have these self-management courses. We have community health uh, programs. We teach our youth on basic counseling skills so that when they go for practicum and attachment, they are able to use those skills. We have parenting programs. We have a service learning and we have volunteer program. We have a program with Professor Mohamed Yunus on innovation clubs. We have technical support to our communities and therefore, we have online short courses that uh, take people from the all of Africa. And we are proud that this is happening because we realize that unless we engage our youngsters with this, um, all these skills to be able to become uh, job creators and create jobs for themselves and others, then Africa, will be doomed. And we are proud that in all these um, 67 nationalities, our presence is felt with these innovations, with the idea that we need to empower the young people to create jobs and be job creators and not job seekers. That yeah. mm -hmm. um, Yes, just, just because of time, uh, we've seen the comments. Somebody's asking, how can they get to work with Tangaza? 
Um, I think Catherine, you're on mute, but ladies and gentlemen, the discussion gets heated up. We only have 20 minutes for Q&A, and this is the part where we let the participants also ask uh, the panelists who just give their input on how youth can get involved as far as strengthening preparedness and resilience for emerging threats are concerned. So um, if you would be, we're looking also, the, the team is also looking at the questions on the Q&A chat, we'll also highlight those. But in the meantime, do feel free to raise your electronic hand or even type your question and we'll be able to respond to that. Um, yes, in regards to um, today's discussion, we're going to share this link. I know why IDP Kenya is going to share this link with every participant on the team. So do not worry, I've seen a comment on the chat. Uh, somebody could not hear us clearly. Mohamed Bundu, perfect. I like when, when people request to be unmuted. Mohamed, over to you. It will be good to also kind of an, um, hear from you on your thoughts about today's discussion. Okay, um, yes. Uh, Yaya, I've seen your hand up. After Yaya, we can go to Mohammed. Yaya, over to you. Yeah, yes. thank you so much um, for uh, the opportunity. And then also thanks to the uh, presenters for this beautiful uh, presentation. And then also their desire to ensure that um, youth inclusivity becomes non-negotiable. Because as a young person and speaking from a young person perspective, I, I, I think that it shouldn't be something that we should be requesting for as of now, young people should still be begging for spaces to make sure that uh, our voices are heard. But it's unfortunate that uh, in our part of the world, it's still a challenge and it, it's still a struggle that um, um, young people are still asking for spaces that are, uh, is, is rightfully theirs and young people are still trying to make sure that they become a response or they, they become part of uh, people that contribute to solutions to issues that are directly affecting us because I don't get it because I believe that he who wears the shoe know well how the shoe pitches and why should young people who are affected by problems and issues are still begging for space to contribute to solutions to this uh, problem it's it really bothering me but I would want to pose a question to uh, Mr. Uh, Mlewa, uh, and also thank you so much for all the help you have been giving to young people. For me, I'm privileged to have met you and I know who you are and what you really want for young people. You know, I, I want to know how do we move from this tokenistic approach that uh, we all have in this system? Young people, it's, everybody keeps saying that young people need to be encouraged, young people need to be brought to the table. We can achieve this with our young people, we can achieve that with our young people. But it has always been a political talk. It has always been tokenistic, there's no action. How do we move from the tokenistic approach and then we we'll move to an action-oriented approach where young people are really being engaged? And when we talk about engagement, I'm talking about ethical and meaningful engagement of young people, taking into consideration all our different diversities, what we need, and not just bring young people to the table just because it, it fits donors' uh, uh, um, a requirement, it fits certain program that young people must be participated. How, how do we ensure that young people are given the rightful ownership to certain participation from onset, just like implementation, beginning of designing of program, implementation, evaluation, through full course of uh, programs and activities that directly affect young people. That is what I, 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 I want to see. Is there any approach? Is there any uh, way that we can ensure that we are actively engaged? Thank you, and over. Thank you very much. And I like that that question has been directed to Onesimus. Um, when Onesimus comes in, I don't know whether Mohamed Bundu Koroma, are you still there? I know you had requested to chime in. I don't know whether you're still there. Mohamed? Okay, no worries. Um, so also when Onesimus- I've, I've always been here. Okay, sorry. So please proceed. Do make your comments, uh, make it short. We only have 11 minutes to go. So it would be good if you make it also brief and direct it to a particular speaker if it's a question. Over to you. It's always the, the advantage of speaking last when we are cut off with time. In, My apologies. Anyway, <laughs> yeah, anyway Madam Chairperson, and Lizzie Otaiwa at the team, I want to thank you very much. I cannot overemphasize the, the importance of this engagement. I only wish that we had enough but more time to have really dealt with more issues. But I think, however, we have done justice to the day which I've highly impressed. So even if I'm going to speak for one minute, that'll be fine. I have one able to go from Sierra Leone, 
um, I, I work for the Senate Youth Coalition on HIV and AIDS. And then despite that, I also belong to many establishments. I have also one time National Youth Council uh, coordinator of my country, Sierra Leone. You know, um, of course, the entire country, um, I last served as the National Youth Council coordinator. So as far as youth issues are concerned, I cannot say I am on top of them, but I think uh, nobody can dispose them in my country without me, if only you are genuine and sincere to address the youth issues. So it's a privilege indeed to have um, got in touch with this program. And I thank um, the um, YIDP for really, you know, making this a um, theme as it is. And it, it shows that it's, you know, we have a um, very responsible and energetic and then poor looking young people. No matter what we do, you know, from where we are, respectively, I mean, across the world, if we cannot be able to link up and to really look at topics that are very critical to us, um, youth welfare, well-being, empowerment, we cannot be able to reach the goal we want. And we cannot get the goal we want more the Africa we desire. So for me, I am very impressed to be here. Um, however, many issues have been discussed, and then which I said, like I said, that I'm impressed. And issues ranging from, um, you know, um, from the, you know, I mean, youth in the, I mean, for me, I want to look at youth in their numbers, with all the issues that have been discussed, the strengths that we have. We have firstly youth in our numbers. Youth are the numbers, I mean, across Africa, even the entire world. But uh, my country population is over uh, 54 to 60 percent of young people, which means that youth are in numbers. That, that's the second strength that we make very good use of. And two, uh, I mean, the, the disease that we have, just by being in numbers, but I think we have the zeal, we have the courage, we have the understanding, and we're always ready to go, even when for the world who has not come. And we should also use the use of that. And of course, due to education, when you look at the, the you know the concerns that we find ourselves, um, how many people are into education? You know, I mean, young people are always on the, on the numbers. So in itself, that we're getting educated, that in itself also another additional advantage. But I think key amongst them all is also that youth innovations. Um, and over the, the last couple of years, uh, not long from now, we've seen the numbers and seeds of youth innovations, you know, creativity that have come. You know, uh, which I think we need to leverage on because um, we are full of talents, we are full of gifts, and we are full of um, you know new ideas and new experiences thinking. And the one that comes out, not everybody wants to be around it. But then, how do we modify that? How do we you know ensure that um, it's, um, beauty bearers and, uh, and stakeholders look forward to that and to ensure that oh, these are young people, we owe, we owe it to them, and then therefore we must ensure that whatever we do, we we are able to put them to a point where. Uh, um, they can be on, on, the, on the top. And then also, I want to lend my voice to the issue of um, youth entrepreneurship. I mean, how do we, it's not about how are they involved in us, but then also as young people, I think um, we should make use of the entrepreneurship space. I'm talking for many countries now, that in my country, we're looking forward to how do we really, you know, support, you know, and youth innovations for self employment creativity, you know, and, and reliance. That can only happen when you can be able to do what you have to do and um, take care of you. However, I cannot end without mentioning the issue of HIV and AIDS as, as, as to how the relevance of youth are. Remember, when we first talked about HIV and AIDS some couple of years ago, uh, the fight itself was, was deadly and it was very tense. But when the youth themselves came on board to the fight across, across Africa, to say, yes, HIV is a concern. HIV is, however, it will kill us. And besides, we are always disadvantaged as young people because once you come to job opportunities, once you come to other opportunities, they already decide on that they have. And this is where, you know, what to look at. And on the HIV and AIDS, we see the world all of us play. And of course, we're able to ensure that um, we fit in and ensure that HIV now, in all its spheres, youth can have their voice. Although some other aspects of their support, they cannot really look at youth issues themselves because somebody mentioned, somebody was there, I'm happy that I had someone from the CCM in his country, I wish to have a contact with him and go back and country for mechanism of CCM for HIV, TB, okay. and malaria. And then so, that, that's it. And it must be able to ensure that let's put it together yeah. and ensure yeah, have to, we have uh, collaboration. Yes. From updates available. Sorry, I have yes. to catch you yes. short. Um, but yeah, thank you very much for those remarks. Uh, Onesmas, if you're still there, the question was, how can we move from the talks of, you know, youth have to do this, youth have to do that. We have a huge number of youth and just make it more actionable. And when yes. Onesmas is coming in to... To respond to that, uh, Perry Kent, the solution that you have, uh, the post to arm solution, um, are youth ready for such kind of solutions that are pro Africans, by Africans? How do you tap into this huge 
because uh, we're being told now we have 1.8 billion youth and adolescents globally. How mm. are you going to tap into that while you, you know, you you have the solution that is community community led and owned. And this is something that will help us even when it comes to, we're talking about malaria vaccines now and distributing this. So how how are you tapping into that huge uh, resource? Um, so I'll let Perry can to respond to that. Then Onesmas, you can come in uh, and respond to the question that was uh, directed to you. Thank you so much and great discussion so far. I think um, before we begin to tap into young people as a resource, there was a point that was raised how do we end tokenism and ensure meaningful youth engagement and involvement? And I think it starts from perceiving young people not just as participants in the system, but as leaders um, of different sectors. And so uh, as long as we continue to look at young people as participants, male participants, tokenism will always be there. But if we want to look at a youth-led approach towards different interventions, then um, you know we can address some of these things. But tapping into young people as a resource, first of all, I think it's a matter of uh, recognizing that young people have the numbers, especially in Africa. We can leverage on that. Um, young people have the energy, young people have the innovation to make very meaningful contributions, especially regarding pandemic preparedness. This is a very futuristic discussion of things that are coming and um, pandemics to come, young people are going to face those pandemics. And so they should be part of the conversation much earlier. And I think I'm of the idea that we can, we can address issues of pandemic preparedness and also address issues of employment when young people are coming on board as, you know, not just as volunteers, but offering their intellect, their energy um, and their, you know, capabilities as a resource towards these interventions that we're implementing, we should not look at young people as mere volunteers. I think young people have relevant skills to bring on the table. They can be employed. They can implement interventions. They can spearhead and lead uh, you know, community-based youth-led organizations that are implementing uh, you know, these uh, interventions with funding, adequate funding um, you know, uh, uh, should be allocated as well. So I think we need to stop looking at young people as participants and look at them as leaders um, and, and, and major stakeholders um, regarding this uh, global response. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you very much. Um, Stacey, I'm going to call you now. Onesmas, are you there? Do you, would you like to chime in? Or has that been covered by um, Perry Kent? Yes, I'm not sure. Yeah, I'm, here. I'm, here, I'm here. I'm here. And um, I think uh, about how do we make sure that youths are now engaged instead of having political talks? I think the opportunities are massive. There are very many organization institutions that allow the meaningful engagement of youth. And I, I, will, I will just want to break this into pieces. One, let's start from the soft side finances. Today, PEPFA has programs that target youth. It's just all about us reaching out to PEPFA and saying, these are our programs. These are our engagement opportunities. We want you to support us. Now, that cannot be done by anyone else other than the youth themselves. And that's why we are saying, it's time for you to take a center stage. We can only pinpoint to opportunities. The Global Fund. Right now, every country in Sub-Saharan Africa is putting in an application to the Global Fund. There is a huge, strong component on adolescence and youth engagement. Youth need to be on the table of the Global Fund writing process. Nobody's going to pull you and put you there. You've got to be there because it's an open process, it's a public process, you cannot say I was denied to be there. All you need to know is that is an opportunity, there is an adolescent and a youth engagement component within the Global Fund Grant, and you want to be on the table to say, these are the youth who want to see implementing this program. Okay. Three, UNFPA through CEDA, they actually have grants on engagement on adolescent sexual drug health and other health issues. It's all about reaching out to UNFPA and saying, UNFPA, we are here. 
what is this grant doing and how do we ensure that we also implement this program? It's about us to be there. So what we can do, it's actually to provide the opportunities and say, these are the opportunities that exist. And for an institution like Yanaso, that is exactly why we exist. We are not a donor. If we had the money, definitely we will be giving it to people, youth and, and all that kind of stuff, but we don't. All we simply do is we have a communication and coordination platform. The role of the communication and coordination platform is exactly what I'm doing here right now to tell you there is money in Global Fund. The Global Fund writing process is going on. You need to be on the table to say, these are the priorities for youth and we want to see them advanced into the country grant. Now, let me go to the political side. That was the softer side of opportunities and resources. And we will keep on sharing this information to you. If anyone is not in our IANASO community engagement platform, please make sure Lizzie has added you there. We post opportunities almost every day. Take a look into that platform. You will know what opportunities exist for you to engage. Now, political side. Normally there's a lot of things that happen at a national level. And people are making decisions about youth every day. I was having this conversation yesterday in Tanzania. And I was saying, why would someone who lived 45 years ago make decision about youth today who have a totally different culture? Because most of the decision makers who make decisions about youth today are making decisions based on their own personal experience. They lived in an era where there were no mobile phones. There was only one radio at the chief's camp. If you are lucky to have a village that had a small chief's camp with a radio. The newspaper was a preserve of the rich. Now, these are the people who sit today and make decisions about how you should actually live. No, it shouldn't be. Yes, they can make decisions because they are at the decision-making table, but they need to be informed. Their decisions need to be informed by us. We need to interact with the parliamentary committees committees that make budgets, committees that make health laws, we need to interact with them. And when there are laws concerning you to tell them, excuse me, wait a minute. The way you used to communicate 40 years ago is not the way we are communicating today. So when you are talking about comprehensive information on adolescents and youth, this is basically what we are talking about in the age today. Yeah, yeah. So I think we need to be involved. These are the opportunities for us to actually occupy. Let us stop the rhetoric of political talk. We need to put words into action, but action will take a youth to move out from their comfort zone and start interacting and making their hands dirty. That's what we need to do. Thank you very much. Thank you. Well said, Nashan, over to you. But I do know, Stacey, boss, uh, you had your hand raised up. Um, are you still there or it's okay for us to proceed? Stacey, I'm hoping I pronounced that right. But either way, yeah. Do you have a question or a comment? Sorry. Yeah. Okay. Actually, I have a question. Um, sure. and it's nice that Onisman uh talked about finance because uh when it comes to finance and pan pandemic, um, how is the how is the communication actually provided to the adolescents? Because you know, for me, I'm actually 15 years old, and well, the pandemic really affected me as an adolescent, and um, because it affected my parents as much. So I wasn't given really much information, and financial status went down, and everything, you know, everything came into a standstill, and it took some time for me to actually accept that we had been. We had gone down through the pan due to the pandemic. Pandemic. So, um, just how do you deal with it exactly? Perfect. And we're talking about how you get access to information, especially around the pandemic. And that's why we have the Pandemic Action Network here. Um, and they have immense um, approach on how they share information, especially with anything new regarding the COVID-19 pandemic or any other pandemic in, in that regard. Um, I'll just request Tangaza University, if you can drop your email on the chats. A lot of people are requesting for that. And in the meantime, I want Nashan to come in. Nashan, how do we get information about the pandemic and other information as far as health, emerging health threats are. Yeah. And after that, uh, we okay. can return by IDP. So Nashan, over to you. 
Thanks, Lizzie. I, th I think uh, one we appreciate that uh, the WHO declared the pandemic uh, as being over. Um, but, you know, um, we know that uh, we still have a problem here. We are, we are not testing. So uh, we stopped testing long time ago. Uh, and I think we are really blind to, uh, you know, how COVID is uh, mutating or, or spreading. Uh, having said that, uh, there were a number of initiatives and uh, Pandemic Action Network did partner with Africa, uh, CDC, and uh, we also engaged very closely with the regional risk communication and community uh, en engagement group that, you know, uh, is a broad network uh, of, of, of many partners across uh, the African uh, continent. Uh, to uh, share information around risk perception around the pandemic uh, and all that. Uh, but, you know, there's a speaker who spoke earlier and, uh, you know, he expressed challenges with, uh, uh, you know, modern technology, uh, use of WhatsApp and, you know, uh, they being discriminatory because of issues of access. There are people, uh, large parts of the African continent that are still rural and do not have access to such platforms. It, it is a good thing and, and where we have access to such uh, uh, technology, let's use it, uh, let, let's, uh, let, let the youth uh, be the online warriors that they have been for good reasons. But I think even before technology, there are things that used to work. Uh, sometimes we tend to forget uh, what used to work for us because people, don't, people are not on WhatsApp, people are not on Facebook or any other platforms. We forget there are things that used to work. Uh, how do we continue or how do we marry uh, the traditional uh, information sharing uh, uh, arrangements that worked in our continent, in our countries and this uh, new technology? So I think we cannot focus into one thing, uh, which is technology, though it's powerful and forget about uh, things that used to work. There are people who used to do road shows, people who used to organize community forums. Those things still work. Uh, so I think it's just a matter of uh, knowing what works uh, where. Um, as Pandemic Action Network, uh, we convene, uh, and, and I think I would really want to encourage um, the youth organizations and you know people who are participating here. Um, we convene uh, a, um, a regional uh, working group that focuses on preparedness and response. And we use that to appraise one another on developments on uh, uh, preparedness and response resilience agenda at the regional and global levels. And, and, and we also invite people from national levels to share. So if you want to hear more about what's happening at Africa CDC uh, level on pandemic preparedness and response, uh, if you want to know about uh, other global conversations that are happening, kindly feel free to join uh, that space. Uh, I think, Lizzie, you have um, uh, my contacts and that of Aminata you can share there. So that, you know, the, the starting point is getting information, getting the awareness of what is happening at the national, at the regional and global levels, then you can plug into those conversations. And lastly, uh, Onesmas did talk about action uh, and, and, and for the political involvement part of it for young people. I'm, 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 I don't want to speak about the program part, but I think we have all talked about the numbers, uh, you know, uh, the power behind the numbers and, and the youth have their numbers, but how do we organize? How do, how do youth organize themselves? How do the youth mobilize themselves? Because you, 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 you won't just be given a seat at the political table. Uh, as I said earlier in my uh, keynote speak, uh, speech, you know, uh, there is a lesson we have learned and that the if something has got no political cost, it's not prioritized. The way the youths mobilize and organize themselves will determine whether they bring a political cost into the equation and start uh, attracting political attention to be included into those spaces. I think uh, I, I, I leave you with those two questions. How do you mobilize and how do you organize? Thank you. Thank you. Definitely. Oh, my God. I feel like YDP will have my neck today. Uh, we're past the time. I need to hand over the discussions back to y YIDP. Uh, Colin, sorry about that. But when we talk about pandemic preparedness, when we're talking about youth involvement, this is usually a heated discussion that can go for hours. So I will hand over and thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. We still have more than 36 people who have just stayed all through the call. Uh, we, we initially went all 
to 50. Um, so I will hand over to Robinson. It was great moderating this session and hope to keep these discussions uh, more vibrant and maybe have another follow-up. Um, Robinson, over to you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Liz. And uh, thanks to the team, the keynote speakers, Perry Kent, Onesmas, Nashon, Catherine, and all other panelists who've, who've contributed to this discussion today. I think it has been a very heated discussion, very well uh, articulated issues around uh, the youth and pandemic. And uh, before I begin, my name is Robin Sonododa. I am the project, uh, uh, project partnership uh, uh, director project and partnership at the youth uh, youth uh, YIDP that is the youth uh, program so in regard to regard to the discussions that we've had here it is true that we've realized that african health system uh, were adequately inadequately prepared in terms of pandemic uh, pandemic occurrence and therefore, I like the final bit by Nashon. Uh, is it on Esmas? How do the youth organize themselves? So at YIDP, we are inviting the organizations that have uh, uh, we are organ we are inviting the organizations and the and the participants that have been here and all the key stakeholders to partner with us in driving the dialogue on strengthening uh, the preparedness and res resilience for the emerging threats that are affecting the, uh, the youth, in particular on what we've discussed here. Together, we can make the lives of the youth in different regions, uh, representing different uh, groups, uh, and contribute in building a stronger and a more resilient community where the youth get opportunity to articulate their issues in regard to pandemic preparedness. So if you're here, you're a youth, you're an organization, uh, and you are interested in partnering with IDP for the upcoming in convention uh, roundtable or have ideas for collaboration, we encourage you to re reach us and join us, work with us. But in particular, we'll talk about the convention that is upcoming, uh, that is uh, will be on 10th to 11th August at uh, uh, Tangaza, where IDP is partnering with Tangaza University and other other organizations such as Triple E, we have Kenya Medical and we have the Zali Foundation. The, uh, the convention will be a round table, very engaging. As you can see, this is just uh, a jog up of what we expect during that convention. And therefore, if uh, you are here and you're interested, please kindly reach out to us, register, get to our website, register and join the convention uh, that is upcoming. Uh, that will be from uh, we've lost you um, Robinson are you still there uh, Collins maybe you can take over yeah yeah yeah, yeah we, we lost, lost Robinson. Robinson okay, okay so, so like, like you were saying, saying uh, we'll, we'll be having, having a convention a convention, a convention is a high level convention and, and we are doing, doing it uh, in partnership with Tangaza University, University the Center of Leadership and Management, management. And, and we, we have a number, number of organizations that we work together, together with, with the district with I, uh, Kenya Medical, Medical Association, and then the Zali Foundation. Foundation. Yes, so I think that's, 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 that's all we're, we're just calling on uh, like-minded like institutions, like-minded uh, people to, to come, come together, together, join us on August 10th and 11th. And 11th. So, so at, at that, that point, point uh, we'll just say thank, thank you. you. Uh, to, to our, our keynote speakers, and okay, thank, thank you to our moderator, Liz. We also, also like, like to thank the, the participants. participants. See you next, next time. time. We're looking forward to see you in Nairobi. 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 Nairobi.